2021. And we're finally <laughs> here. So in person. So thank you for your patience. Uh, and we're super excited to have you. Uh, Professor Davis uh, comes to us from Ann Arbor. She is currently uh, a fellow at the University of Michigan. She will start as an assistant professor there in the fall of 2022. Uh, she received her PhD from Berkeley in 2020. Immediately, you took a prestigious presidential postdoctoral fellowship at UCSD that year, uh, and since then at Michigan. So she works on broadly speaking comparative politics and political behavior with a specific interest in Sub-Saharan Africa. So today, we're going to hear about some of her work on her broader project on democratization uh, in post-conflict societies in Africa. So, thanks so much. Thank you, Don, and thank you all for coming two years in the making. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting a part of my book project. Um, my book project is generally about the impact and the constraints to civil society organizations' abilities to bring democracy after conflict. Um, so today's talk about altruism and civil society leaders, legacies of contested governance. This is a photo of an NGO um, in Boake, which is the former rebel capital of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and as you can see from this, um, this image, this organization, um, Boake Ibe, uh, is a health organization and they've gotten a lot of international funding. This is all of their partners. Um, and so this is um, part of, as I said, a broader project um, that asks how does civil war affect civil society organizations leader behavior? and their ability to bring forth democracy after war. And so as we know, democratization after civil war faces a number of obstacles, weak institutions, polarized society, and of course, the risk that a conflict will, will recur. Civil society organizations are th thus seen as purveyors of democratic norms in post-conflict settings. Almost $25 billion has been allocated to such organizations in African countries during and after a civil war, similar to the organization that I showed you at the beginning. These organizations are focused on reducing violence, cultivating um, democracy, fostering development, and they're seen as more efficient and effective, more accountable and more transparent and reliable than the government. And yet we know little about the leaders of these organizations. Do they themselves have democratic beliefs? And do their actions and behaviors reflect from social attitudes that they are expected to inculcate in the citizenry that they work with? So um, these are countries that have experienced a civil war since 1990. Um, and I wanna draw a couple of examples from a USAID Civil Society Sustainability Index report um, to illustrate um, some of the motivation behind this project. So in Sierra Leone, the report says that some NGOs have lost credibility because they're seen as protecting interests of political parties. In Liberia, the public and government view these organizations as politicized and are hostile towards them. In South Sudan, as the conflict has gone on, national NGOs have faced allegations of bias of either supporting the government or supporting the rebel movement. And finally, in Mozambique, the public sees the initiatives that are put on by these NGOs as benefiting the leaders rather than the citizens. So this brings me to the two questions that I hope to address today in this talk. What are the effects of living under contested rebel control, a facet of civil war, on civil society leaders' behavior? And then the broader question, how does war affect the ability of these organizations to contribute to post-conflict democratization when they face a number of constraints, including some of those examples that I just gave? So to preview the talk today, I'm going to go over the existing explanation, the conventional model of the relationship between civil society and democratization. I'm going to present a part of my book theory on the wartime experiences of civil society organizational leaders. I will then um, elaborate the research design, which included interviews, surveys, and a lab in the field with civil society organizational leaders in Cote d'Ivoire. And then I want to just preview the main findings, which is that civil society organizational leaders who lived under rebel control are less likely to redistribute funds and more likely to, to discriminate against the outcome. So first, I want to just go over some concepts. So who are civil society organizational mm -hmm. leaders? Well, there are consequential actors for development and democracy. They control large portfolios of um, international funding uh, to do activities such as voter education, uh, civic education, health programs uh, in 
both post conflict and um, non post conflict cultures. They also are more likely to be educated and urban based than the general population. They work closely with international donors and government officials, which makes them distinct from regular citizens. A civil society organization is one that's formally registered, private, not for profit, and has public welfare goals. I focus explicitly on organizations that are created and run by local populations with headquarters in country. And the reason I focus on this type of organization in particular is because I want to understand how um, leaders who are from the country have experienced civil war and how that shapes the way they are able to contribute to democracy, as opposed to an international organization, um, which is, is um, headed by expats. And so the existing explanations uh, for the relationship between civil society and democracy is that these organizations are expected to develop these kind of pro-social norms, right? Tolerance, moderation, trust, reciprocity. In conflict and post-conflict settings, they're expected to decrease violence, increase cooperation between groups, and reduce intergroup conflict. But I join a subset of scholars that look at civil society and argue that the institutional environment in which these organizations emerge and are operating may actually induce negative behaviors as opposed to these kind of more positive pro-social behaviors that are expected. And so to kind of make a diagram of this conventional model, the idea is that civil war has a negative effect on democratization, making it more difficult, um, whereas civil society is expected to have a positive effect on democratization. And so I kind of nuance and update this model by saying that civil society's effect is conditioned by war, and in particular, the experiences of the leaders during the war. And so to expand on this theory, um, I focus on one aspect of civil war, which is contested rebel control. And by contested rebel control, I mean that there's contestation between the rebels and the national military, or there's contestation between rebels and citizens or within rebel groups, even between rebel groups. In this context, contested rebel control represents a breakdown of order and an introduction of new institutions. I argue that this generates uncertainty for civil society organization leaders because the aim of rebels is to remove the existing political order, but it's unclear whether, um, like, who will ultimately be in charge and whether these rebels will provide public goods um, to the population. I thus argue that contested rebel control is more destabilizing for these civil society organization leaders than continuous government control due to this uncertainty. And what do I mean by uncertainty? So I conceptualize uncertainty as unclear variation in access to public goods. And so if these civil society organizations are expected to be delivering these public goods, but they don't know if the rebels will or the government will, um, that creates uncertainty. I also conceptualize it as fear of an actual experience of violence um, by the rebels, by the government, by whomever. And then finally, that uncertainty um, manifests in concerns over whom to trust um, for these civil society organization leaders. These leaders are seen as first responders during wartime and are often um, allocated aid and um, activities, um, humanitarian and aid activities. And so the uncertainty that is generated by this contested rebel control affects how these leaders are able to interact with formalized entities, whether it's the government or the rebels, whether they can access communities that need this aid, and whether they receive funding from inside and outside of the country. And so I argue that living under uncertainty and contested rebel control induces parochial altruism. Parochial altruism can be thought of as increased allegiances um, and hardened hostility towards the outgroup. And so it means you'll help your group first and you'll discriminate against the, the outgroup. And so my expectations are that under conditions of uncertainty and contested rebel control, civil society organization leaders begin to discount the value of helping others and reserve more for themselves as insurance. And so they will in, in turn redistribute fewer resources. Additionally, um, because of uncertainty under rebel control, they will have to rely on cues to figure out who they can trust to avoid helping enemies. And they often will rely on ascriptive identity cues, such as ethnicity or uh, political affiliation. And so then they will discriminate based on that um, identity. I expect there will be increased discrimination for these leaders that live under uncertainty and rebel. 
I'm particularly interested in the long-term consequences of these attitudes and behaviors. Um, and so what happens once the war is over? Well, if the war um, ends and the underlying drivers of war have not been addressed, um, these behaviors will persist. So civil society organization leaders uh, will continue to discriminate and continue to redistribute less. Um, and they also have learned that their behaviors were effective during wartime, so getting access to the communities that they need to reach. And so they will continue to use them as well. And then finally, they will pass this on in kind of institutional learning within the organizations um, because it was a successful strategy before. And so this is why these behaviors will persist into the post-conflict period. And so just to recap the theory, I argue that under contested rebel control and the confiscation can be between rebels and government, between rebels or within the rebels, uh, creates uncertainty for civil society organization leaders, variation in public good, uncertainty over whether they will fall victim to violence, and uncertainty over who to trust. And this leads to parochial altruism in the civil society organization leaders, in which they distribute less and become more discriminatory. So I test this theory in Cote d'Ivoire, um, which experienced a civil war from 2002 to 2011. During that period, rebels controlled almost 50% of the national territory during the war, this gray area, the white area was under government control. In 2003, the French um, military and the UN set up a buffer zone called the Zone de Confiance, um, and that's here in the black dotted lines, with the intent to prevent fighting between the rebels and the government. In 2010, the rebel supported candidate won elections, um, which sorry, um, erupted in a uh, violent contestation between the incumbent and the uh, now uh, president, um, in which the um, former president had to be removed from office um, by the military um, and was sent to the ICC uh, for crimes against humanity. He was acquitted just years ago. So to illustrate this idea of contested rebel control in Cote d'Ivoire, um, in comparing the rebel controlled areas to government controlled departments, which are the um, third lowest uh, unit in uh, administrative unit in Cote d'Ivoire, rebel controlled departments experience more battles than government controlled departments. Rebel perpetrated violence only occurred in rebel controlled departments. So what this means is that rebels were not actually able to victimize uh, people on the government side, but they were able to victimize people on the rebel side. However, people who lived in the rebel controlled departments also experienced violence against them by government forces. So not only were rebels using violence against civilians, um, but the government was also using violence against civilians in the rebel controlled areas. This was not the case in the government controlled areas. There also was contestation between rebel groups. Um, so there were militias in the West that were financed and supported by the government fighting against the rebels. Um, there were mercenaries from Liberia and Sierra Leone that were in the rebel control territories. Um, and often what my interviews would say is that there was a lot of uncer uncertainty over who was actually in charge in certain locations at any given moment. And then finally, there was confiscation within rebel groups. Um, there were classes, clashes between rogue followers um, of one general and, and the main rebel leadership. There are disputes over human rights abuses by local commanders, and the, uh, the local commanders in Bouaké actually had to go um, to prevent violence against um, civilians by their own um, rebel commanders. And then there was variation in local commander behavior. So, you know, one commander is in charge, um, and he's using a lot of violence, and then he's out, and the next guy is also using violence. So there is a lot of change, variation in whether violence would be um, meted out against civilians. And then finally, there was changes in this administration without predictability. Um, so, so my interviewees told me that there would be a new commander and they wouldn't know how long he would be there for. Um, and then the next week, someone new would show up. Um, so there's a lot of um, inability to predict who actually was in charge. So one thing that's really difficult about studying the effects of contested rebel control on behavior is that the areas that are under rebel control in Cote d'Ivoire are far from the economic center. So um, Abidjan is the economic capital, so it's quite far. Um, they are poorer than the places that were under government control, and they contain different ethnic groups than the places that were under government control. So it makes it really difficult to actually study um, the differences between these two regions. And so what I've done is I've utilized a pre um, 
uh, pre-treatment, we could say before um, matching case selection, in which I match departments, which again are the third lowest administrative unit in Percy Bar, um, to each other on a number of dimensions. So the first is the distance to the economic capital. The second is the incumbent vote share before the war, um, the percent of northerners, so ethnic groups that are from the north. Um, average night lights and average child mortality are proxies for poverty. Um, and so I match departments on these dimensions with the idea that by trying to um, eliminate these kind of observable geographic and political factors, uh, we can get closer to understanding the, the, the effect of um, contested rebel control on civil society organization leader behavior. And so this resulted in 21 departments, 21 match departments um, across the um, 13 in the rebel controlled and eight, no, 13 in the government controlled, eight in the, um, in the rebel controlled areas. And as you can see, I don't know if this has a highlighter, yeah. As you can see, they're kind of clustered around the zone of confidence, um, which actually I, I think is, is, a, is a good thing because it means that these areas were, more or less as likely to fall under rebel control had the zone de confiance not been put there, right? Um, the rebels were explicitly trying to take over Abidjan, but also San Pedro, which is the largest port um, where all of the, the cocoa goes out of. Um, and so their intent was to actually travel down through this area um, before the zone de confiance was constructed. And just to show you what this matching looks like, so, um, you know, the, for the most part, um, the matching does um, reduce differences between these areas. Um, I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A about the variables in which it doesn't. Um, but I also can show that other pre-war variables, in addition to the five that I matched on, um, are, are balanced. And so um, I employed a multi-method strategy to, um, to answer my research question. I conducted interviews and participant observation across Cote d'Ivoire, um, as well as in the um, 21 selected departments. I then conducted an organizational and individual survey of civil society organizations in the 21 selected departments. And finally, I invited participants in the organization survey to participate in a lab in the field um, in five areas. And so today I'm gonna to be focusing primarily on the lab in the field. Um, so a lab in the field is um, effectively a laboratory environment in uh, which um, I brought together subjects in a common location in their own environment to study their behavior. Um, lab in the field are useful for measuring behavior and attitudes, and I adapted experimental games to the local context. And I'll explain um, the experimental games in, in a moment. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about sampling. And so I arrived in Cote d'Ivoire in 2017. I was like, okay, I need to get a list of civil society organizations, and then I will sample from this list. Uh, but I arrived, and, and this is a picture of the prefecture of Bwake, which um, again is the former rebel capital. And as you can see, there's papers to read about. And so I arrived here and I say, okay, can I please have a list of civil society organizations? And they said, oh, that was destroyed when our uh, prefecture got ransacked. And this was a common story across the country where lists just didn't exist. Um, there were poor record keeping of registrations, there was lots of administrative data during the war and after the war. Um, and so it became kind of impossible to get kind of a comprehensive list um, from any one place. And so I collated a bunch of lists from a variety of um, places. So organization leaders um, that were connected to local networks, the European Union who was doing kind of a survey of civil society organizations, um, and then I went to independent of the, the government offices to collect lists, and I kind of collated a list together. Um, then we snowball sampled from that list. So we called people, asked them to participate in the survey, and then asked them to list any of their peers that they think that we should also contact or peers that worked during the war and civil society organization or after the war um, to participate. Um, and so they took uh, an organization survey online. 163 organizations participated in this survey in the 21 selected departments. Um, and then they were invited to participate in a workshop in which we embedded the lab in the field. And so this is where the workshops took place. They took place in four different locations in Cote d'Ivoire over the course of two weeks. 
Um, and we, and you can, these are the 21 selected departments, so you can see that um, folks from these four areas, Pedro, these in the Mon, et cetera, um, to participate. And so the lab in the field was embedded in a capacity building workshop. And I embedded it in a capacity building workshop for two reasons. The first reason was kind of pragmatic. Um, the, the lab in the field is kind of artificial. And so we wanted to create an environment that the civil society organization leaders were used to. Um, and they, are, they commonly go to capacity building workshops put on by various international organizations. But the second reason that I did this was actually because when I was doing my interviews, the leaders that I interviewed said, well, we're giving you all this information for your dissertation. Like, what are you going to give back to us? Um, and so I asked them what would they like. I mean, mostly they wanted funding, which I couldn't provide. But I said, okay, so what else could I, you know, as, as a student, what can I provide for your grad student? Um, and they said, we want to learn more about volunteering culture and fundraising in the U.S. How do organizations like us operate in the U.S.? And so with um, free research assistance, we created these presentations on volunteering and fundraising that we gave as part of the capacity building workshop. Um, and you can see in this photo, that's me. And this is walking. I'm talking about when I was in high school, I volunteered with various organizations. Um, and so um, it introduced realism, but I also felt like it was a way to give it back to um, these leaders who were help, you know, helping me with my research. And so the lab in the field consisted of, first they took a survey about their experiences during the war, then they attended the capacity building workshop, and then they played a series of dictator games, which I'll elaborate in a little bit. There were on average 24 leaders um, per session, um, and this is kind of the demographic breakdown of those leaders. So 167 participated in the lab in the field, about 41% were from rebel departments, 21% female, um, 30, they were around 35 to 44 years old, mostly completed secondary school, 17% um, Muslim, 26% Northerner. And it was pretty um, split as far as whether they supported the incumbent or not. The most common domain in which they worked was social cohesion. And I think this is particularly relevant because this idea about pro-social norms is directly related to social cohesion. So they are trying to inculcate these kind of pro-social norms by doing this social cohesion work. And 43% of these organizations were funded by international partners. So they played these dictator games. So the respondent was allocated um, a sum of real money. So they got this money at the end of the games. Um, 6,000 from SEPA, they could keep up to 6,000 from SEPA, which is $10 for themselves, or they could allocate 7,500 from SEPA, which is $12 to others. And this is roughly equal to what a per diem would look like if they had attended the capacity building workshop put on by someone like National Democratic Institute or something. They played alone on tablets and they didn't have interactions with the recipients that they were allocating the money to. The recipients were actually unknown to them. Um, I'll describe in a moment what the recipients, how they knew about the recipients. But after um, the games were finished, I did um, allocate the money to the recipients that um, they, they allocated. There were three rounds of three games per round. And so this is what the games look like. So in the first round, they were told they could allocate 1,000 from SEPA and 100 from SEPA points to an association that is from their department or not. And, and then, um, so they, there's three choices. Which, oh, I'll show you here. This is what the game looked like. So you had three choices for where you could allocate the money to yourself, to an association who was from your department or not, or with the majority of members were the same ethnicity as you or not, and or the majority of members were the same political ideology as you. And so this is the example of the third option here. And so they would say, okay, I want to give myself five points, I want to give this one three points, and this one two points. And so they did that in round one. And so there are three, three times they saw this in round one. In round two, I forced them to discriminate. So they couldn't keep all of the money for themselves. They had to allocate um, some of the, at least um, half of the money elsewhere, but the same three types across the game. And then the final game, they really had to discriminate because um, instead of 10 coins, they had two coins or two bills. Um, and in this case, no person could keep both coins. So they, they couldn't keep both coins and they couldn't give both coins to this group. Um, and so then they, they had to discriminate. 
And so the outcomes for this, for the analysis that I'm going to show you is for the idea of redistribution is the share of the amount they kept for themselves. So the out of the amount that they could have kept, so 6,000 plus data. And then discrimination is the share of the total amount that they didn't keep that was allocated to groups different from themselves. So non co ethnic non co partisan and people from or associations from different departments. And so just to recap the theory really quickly, um, I argue that contested rebel control creates uncertainty for civil society organization leaders, which leads to parochial altruism in which they distribute less and they're more discriminatory. And so this is the result of the games that uh, the civil society organization leaders play. Um, and as you can see, the leaders that come from the former rebel, the former rebel controlled area, this is the darker blue, um, kept on average 67% uh, for themselves. Um, this is compared to civil society organization leaders from the government controlled areas, which kept on average 56% for themselves. Regarding discrimination, um, CSL leaders uh, would were that were from the rebel controlled areas were more likely to discriminate against the outgroup, meaning they gave less to the outgroup. Um, as you can see here in the darker blue, those civil society organization leaders from former rebel controlled areas gave um, about 28% away um, compared to those from the government areas in which they gave only 36%. And these results hold even if we control for individual and organization level characteristics, if we exclude the departments that were far from the zone de confiance, so we kind of um, just look at the, the departments that are along that line. And also if we only examine those we could, could, could consider wartime leaders. And so the leaders who participated in this game um, were not limited to those who had become leaders during the war. Um, it also included leaders uh, who came, became leaders after the war or before the war. And so if we only look at people who were leaders during the war, the results um, still hold. And so I want to illustrate these results with these games that, that are kind of artificial, um, but I want to show with the kind of real world story of how this manifests. Um, in Cote d'Ivoire. So I'm focusing in on one department in the West that was under rebel control called Man, who is my favorite place in, in Cote d'Ivoire. It's got it's mountains. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, and so regarding redistribution, my interviewees, I, I have a couple of quotes from my interviewees here from Man, in which they said 75% or more of organizations are not doing the work that they're funded to do. Um, another leader said during the war, organizations stole rights instead of distributing it. Another leader uh, said they just boost the money, and boost here is, is a slang term to mean eat. Um, so they just like, keep the money for themselves. And they said, when you see people dying of hunger, these organizations steal the money. You know, it, it upset, upset the, this leader that gave this quote. Um, so they were very quick to kind of condemn other organizations in their community for not, for, for not being altruistic and for not redistributing um, funds. They also were quick to condemn their um, organizations in our community uh, with regards to discrimination. So one leader said that um, that he never gets invited to events that are put on by some organizations uh, because he's not the same ethnicity as uh, the leaders of those organizations. So and he said they those organizations help their own ethnicity and forget about others um, and see other organizations as enemies. One civil society organization leader who originally was from Abidjan but was living in Mon said, I'm Ebrier, which is an ethnic group in Abidjan. Um, and he said, I have no friends here. It's difficult to work with leaders here. And he attributed that um, to his ethnicity. And so the mechanism here is uncertainty, this idea of uncertainty. So variation in public goods, fear of and experience victimization, and uncertainty over who we trust. And so in the survey that they took during the lab in the field, I asked, to what extent do you agree with the following statements? During the war, I felt in danger. I did not feel that the rule of law persisted. I did not know who was in charge. I feared the rebels, I feared the government, and I felt discriminated against due to my identity. And across all of these measures, um, those civil society organization leaders that come from the former rebel controlled areas um, were significantly more likely to say that they lived in uncertainty, that the rule of law was unclear, they lived in danger, 
they feared the rebels, they feared the government, and they feared that they would be discriminated against due to their identity. Uh, to return to Yuman, uh, this organization leader, she um, started an organization um, in during the war um, to help women and orphans. Um, and she said that the rebels failed to provide basic infrastructure across the West. Um, there was uncertainty over who would provide security or rule of law. There was a lot of, um, there was no justice, um, essentially. Um, and she said the rebels ruled by laws of rebellion and impunity. She actually was arrested during the war uh, because um, they thought that she was colluding with the government. Um, and she was targeted because of her last name, which sounds like a name um, that comes from the former government's ethnic group, but she actually isn't a member of the ethnic group. She also described that during the war, she felt that she uh, would be victimized um, due to her work that she was doing. Um, she had trouble accessing communities and was threatened by rebels because of the work that she completed. Um, as I mentioned, she was accused of supporting the government due to her ethnicity, and rumors about partisanship abounded across um, the communities, and many communities were hesitant to work with these civil society organizations because they didn't know whose side they were on. And so to conclude, um, what I've made a contribution to is I've elaborated a theory of how the wartime experience of civil society organization leaders affects their behavior. Um, I've shown some national variation in the impact of civil war on the potential of these organizations to contribute to democracy. And I leverage lab in the field design with a pre-treatment matching strategy to answer theoretically motivated yet difficult to answer questions. As for the implications of post-war democratization, if civil society organizations leaders behave this way, they may reinforce cleavages that existed and were um, the origin of the war itself. They may also contribute to polarization um, if civilians think that they're partisan um, and if they are discriminating against certain groups. And it may inhibit the distribution of resources inclusively to communities that need it. Um, and so one takeaway is that we can't assume that these leaders will contribute to democracy unless we consider the dynamics that shape their behavior. And now, to be clear, I don't want the takeaway to be that these civil society organization leaders are bad people. They had to come up with st strategies in order to navigate and survive living in you know, this uncertainty during the war. Um, and they do generally um, want to contribute to the betterment of society. Um, but they are constrained because of their experiences and, and have had to develop these behaviors and attitudes in order to get their work done. And this is part of my broader book project, which is entitled Uncivic Legacy, Civil Society and Democratization in Post-Conflict Africa. Um, it, I, I, you know, illustrate the puzzle of civil society democratization after war. I present it here today, part of the theoretical framework the wartime experiences of civil society organization leader behavior. Um, I also developed a theory about post-war politics um, and the organization leadership behavior, as well as a theory on citizen civil society relationships and post-conflict settings. And then I presented one of the empirical chapters on the wartime experiences of leaders, um, and the other empirical chapters will look at uh, the post-war environment and how rebel victory has led to ethnic favoritism in civil society and the impact that can have on redistribution and discrimination. And finally, this summer, I am fielding a citizen level survey to understand better the perceptions um, and preferences of citizens as to how they want their leaders to behave and how they want to be distributed, whether it's through the government or through um, civil society organizations. Um, so I will be fielding that this summer. I actually just did that report this morning. Um, <laughs> and um, so that will be the kind of the, the concluding chapter of, of the um, book. Um, and so thank you for listening. Um, and I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Thank you. All right, um, I will keep a question queue for Professor Davis. Um, if folks online want to make sure they have an opportunity, if they could put 
a question in the chat or use the raise your hand function, whichever is more convenient. I'll make sure I'm checking in on that as well. But any questions? Oh, sure. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just have um, so um, I'm just wondering how you theorize the very ideal civil society. Um, from your presentations, I had this feeling they're splitting them to NGOs, and I didn't feel that it's a distinction between one organization and the other. So I'm just thinking in that context, um, it's common for organizations to write not because they really want to do something good, because the form of survival as well. Especially if you think about civil society from a neoliberal perspective, where they're concentrated on distributing aid, as you said, what prevents people to just form organization for the very purpose of getting something? So, um, so then is the challenge with leadership or the very idea of civil society? Great. Um, so I, um, I tried to be kind of more encompassing of um, who, count, who counted as a civil society organization. So there are these kind of formalized NGOs, you know, that have a uh, title like um, NGO for Iranian democracy, right? Um, but there also were women's organizations, local associations, village um, associations, agricultural co-ops um, with that were included in, in the study. And I think you're right, and, and it certainly did happen that organizations were created just to get funding, right? Um, there was um, a, a woman who talked about um, NGO in a bag, um, where they don't actually have a headquarters, they just go, you know, they get this funding and then they put it in their bag and then they leave. Um, the other common one was, you know, in French, um, it's ONG, and they said it's an ENG, which is not, an organization, but an individual, right? Um, and so this is certainly, certainly common and certainly exists. Um, I can't say with any certitude because I couldn't figure out a way to get people to admit that their organization was fun, founded this way. Um, whether there, there, these types of very egoist um, leaders were in my sample, um, but. I, I, I think that, that this, is a, this is a really good point, and it certainly is one that, um, that I should, should engage with more in, in the paper and in the book as well. So. Um, Rich, I have an online question. Yeah. I'll, I'll relay from uh, Amma Mohammed. Um, what language did you conduct your study in English or French? If English, did you face any communication or linguistic challenges while assisting CSO leaders to navigate the big two? Um, so everything was conducted in French. Um, I speak French. I lived in France for six years, um, and um, everything was conducted in French, um, primarily because, I, so when I first started working in Cote d'Ivoire in 2012, I wanted to know what local language I should learn um, in addition to French. Um, but it became quickly clear to me that any choice that I made would have political ramifications, right? So if I chose to learn Jula, then the people would think that I was pro-government. If I chose to learn Betsy, which is, that goes um, at this season, they would think I was pro, pro opposition. So I I worked um, exclusively in French. Um, however, I feel that people so people were able to participate in the games, and I think that you know French being the lingua franca in Cote d'Ivoire um, is important. The Apple barometer actually doesn't and it's rarely um, uses the local languages. Actually, most of the time it's conducted in French, which did give me some. You know, made me feel okay. I, it, you know, I'm able to communicate with almost everyone um, with just French. Uh, um, uh, thanks for a really fascinating presentation. Um, so, my question has to do with a little bit of the theory um, on risk and uncertainty. So, I was wondering, you know, what do you think is doing the work? Because, at least as I understand, right, so there was a civil war, and so uh, there was heightened risk that everyone was facing. Uh, and there was also un heightened uncertainty. It wasn't clear who the winner was going to be. Uh, and these two things, you know, would be nice theoretically at least to be able to distinguish the effects of the two. Uh, maybe that, that's a full theorem, but I'd love to hear about, you know, 
yeah, how, how you thought about those two, whether it's worth, worth passing them or not. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, I think it, it is, I think it's, it is both in a lot of ways, right? Um, in that, you know, starting an organization could like, come with this nice, you know, getting money from international funders, but also comes with the risk of, you know, I ha now have to, if I'm you know, committed to doing the work, I now have to go out and, and into an uncertain environment um, and conduct these activities. Um, and so I think you're right. I need to think a little bit more about risk and uncertainty and whether they can actually be um, kind of fleshed out. I did a follow-up survey with the leaders that participated in the lab this year. No, last year, um, and I did ask them about risk because this was something um, that that I'm, I'm still trying to kind of probe. Um, and there actually weren't differences in response between um, leaders from the rebel controlled areas and the government controlled areas as far as risk. The uncertainty thing really was the difference. And I actually, oh. I, I presented the leaders with the results of the games and I said, why do you think I got these results? Um, and overwhelmingly, they said it was because of uncertainty and not because of the funding issue. Because one, one thing that um, has come up is, are they, uh, you know, maybe they're poor or they don't have as much money. Um, but the, the number one answer was that, they, that people lived in this kind of uncertain environment and so this is why they want to behave this way. Um, so I think based on those results and, and I should, you know, think a little bit more about how to theorize this. I think that it is really uncertainty that's doing a lot of the work. Um, but I can think harder about it. I can flesh these out. Yeah. Just, just to think of one way of actually sort of testing this a little more. Uh, so the uncertainty might have varied across space and time uh, as to what was uncertain, right? So you have the, you have measures the degree to which people are favoring certain uh, uh, people of certain ethnicities or people of particular parties or mm -hmm. partisanship. And so in places where partisanship was more contested, you should see particular patterns versus where ethnicity. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. Not my field, but I part of the reason I love Africa is really all these things. You know, the results of this are are they're complicated for the people who live in Cote d'Ivoire. And I'm wondering how do you as a social scientist negotiate sharing the results of something like this with these communities and, and how does the act of actually doing these kind of surveys influence the behavior of the of leaders themselves. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I was wary about presenting the results, um, especially to the leaders who come from the rebel controlled areas. Although, you know, I made clear that like I couldn't distinguish who was which, you know, like um, from the from these kind of um, aggregate results. Um, but I talked to my RAs about it, and they said no, like. They, they should know, you know, we should share with them the results um, and then get their opinion on why we got these results. So what I did in this follow-up survey was I asked first, which, like I just explained, this is what the games you played, this is, this is what we were actually doing. Um, and so I said, which way do you think the results went? And I asked, you know, do you think that the rebel controlled areas gave more or kept more? Or, um, and then I had them explain why they said thought that. Um, and the answers were, were it, it was kind of remarkable because I was worried that like my theory was really wrong, right? <laughs> um, and they actually validated my theory. They said, oh, well, like th there was one really great quote um, that I have in the book chapter where a guy said, yeah, they, they're gonna help themselves out first because they lived in this, like they were living with the rebels people in them and then they will help others. And so they were kind of not surprised by the results and they um, weren't, they didn't express, at least to my knowledge, like any you know, anger at me. And I tried to kind of, you know, um, frame the, the, the follow-up survey as, you know, we're, I'm trying to understand why I got these results more than like, this is definitive, you know, this is how these people behave. Um, and so they gave me a lot of feedback on ways that they thought that this relationship was working. Um, and so it felt more like they were trying to also just like understand it themselves as well as, um, Understand the the the, the one. Yeah. Thank you for this very fascinating presentation. So mine is more of comments than questions. 
because yeah, I'm gonna direct the question to you. So it's about the point you made when you said that your research collaborators um, were interested in what you are going to give back to them or what they will gain from you after they've after you've after they've supported you or helped you assisted you with this education. So it made me kind of wonder, and I don't know how far this conversation has gone on um, in the African Studies program here at Peter University, but um, I, I found it very fascinating. Like scholars from the West, um, and in most cases, white scholars, and in some other cases, Africans who are trained in the West go back to Africa and uh, get a lot of assistance, a lot of information. Um, these people are, some, are sometimes open up their doors and allow you to live among them for weeks or months for years conducting research. And what do we really give back to them? I know these scholars, scholars will not have money, so we may not be able to provide money for them, but what do we give back to them? How do we um, repurpose our research or position our research in such a way that it will be useful to this society? Um, because most times we end up producing book monographs that you find out some of these people cannot afford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the native people may not be able to afford this. So how do we, and I don't know if aside from what you do, the workshop, you can also talk about um, other ways in which your research can be useful to these people and society. Yeah, so that's a, this is a question that is very important to me. So um, that was one of the reasons why I, wanted to incorporate the, you know, the, the workshop into the lab in the field um, was because I got this feedback from people. Um, I also, I've run um, trainings um, in statistical software in Abidjan for um, people who want to learn more. So like R, I taught R classes, which was actually kind of me teaching myself and then them me teaching them. Um, but um, so I've done things like that. Um, I've done some collaborative research projects. I've done some publications with local folks. Um, I um, actually just did, um, I have a co-authored paper um, where we asked, we looked at um, survey enumerators and asked them about their experiences conducting surveys because often when you think about IRB, it's only protecting the respondents. Um, it's not actually protecting the people who collect this information. But these people are going into violent potentially violent settings, potentially being harassed. Um, and we conducted a survey of enumerators in Cote d'Ivoire and we asked them, you know, what challenges did you face? And over 60% faced violence to them to themselves, either through harassed the threats of violence or actual violence, being detained. Um, and that, that was shocking to, to us. Like we we expected there to be some level, um, but not quite that high. Um, and so we asked them like how could we improve you know, survey research, because a lot of us, you know, rely on survey research in, in Africa, and especially in these kind of um, post-conflict insecure settings. Um, and so what they actually said was the issue is primarily with the respondents themselves. The respondents don't know why you're coming. They don't know why you're asking these questions about politics. Um, they don't know what you're going to do with the information. You say you're from, you know, you, know, you work for a researcher, but I don't know you. Um, so, and, and the Afrobarometer actually has a question at the end that asked who sent who sent us, um, and a high proportion say the government. So they think that it's the government that's asking these questions. And so, one suggestion um, the enumerators made was to make the results legible to the population that's participating. Um, and so, one suggestion in this article that we currently under review that we wrote was um, you can maybe give a card when you do a interview or do a survey that has a link to where you could put the results. And it would be not like the, you know, the hard to interpret statistical results, but maybe just some descriptive statistics, um, just to show the respondent how things are aggregated, right? So it's not just you, you said this, it's this many people said this, right? Um, and they may be able to access the results that way. Um, and so to kind of create this communication line between the researcher who's often abroad, um, and the local population. So that was one other um, idea that we had, and we kind of put it into practice by, we distributed the results of this enumerator survey back to the enumerators that participated. Um, so those, yeah, so those are some ideas. And I, I, yeah, I'm trying to not be extractive, right? Like, I don't want this job in my career to be built on extraction. And so um, I, it's really important to me to figure out ways, even, you know, I don't have tons of money to, like, do a 
There were more organizations started since Watara, the current president, has been empowered from his own ethnic group. Why not? And what I find is that there was a huge uptick in organizations started by um, his co ethnics, co partisans, after he came into power. And they're more likely to work in democracy promotion. Um, and so I think that this is linked to these perceptions where the opposition sees these organizations coming into their community promoting democracy, but thinks, oh, you're, you know, same ethnic group as the president. Why should I listen to you when I don't, you know, like him? And so I think um, that, 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 that that does link up um, as far as whether or not they are um, affiliated with the government. Yeah. Uh, I'll take it short, but thank you so much for your talk. Um, uh, Mr. Hudson is planning to talk in my book, Shad's words, work on political identity in the government. And uh, I'm not because you 
you mentioned democracy over and over and the role of society is mainly uh, in solidifying uh, uh, democratic practices in this post war uh, um, Indian space. So, I'm going to ask if you have a working theory of democracy, especially as developed among NGOs in global areas, especially because, as you said, these areas are far away from different centers in those places. So, it would be interesting to hear what they think, how they define democracy. And then think of what they think could be a new condition or or you know uh to improve the conditions in this system. Great. Um so when I first started doing my interviews, I was trying to kind of figure out who was a democracy promoting organization, right? Um and so I would ask, ask you know, do your democracy you do that? I just kind of asked a kind of very simple question. And everybody, no matter if it was a health organization or a women's organization or an agricultural co-op or a human rights organization, said that the work they were doing was contributing to democracy. Um, and if, I think I have a I think I have a slide on this, but um most of the organizations said that they were contributing to democracy when I asked them like what domains do you work in? Um and so they all had, as you as you know, different ideas of how what their work was doing was contributing to democracy. So like the health NGO, and they said they're um, creating more access to healthcare, um, which is kind of democratizing the access to healthcare, right? Um, and so they weren't necessarily doing things like voter registration, um, but they felt in the activity that they were doing was somehow contributing to democracy. The other thing um, of note is that most of these organizations work in on average four and a half um, domains. So they often are flexible. So they, you know, they may be an agricultural co-op, but they can go to education initiatives too, right? Um, and so they seem pretty flexible, especially when it came to funding as to what activities they, their organization could or would do. Um, and in that way, they, they said, oh yeah, we did participate in a voter education campaign in 2015, so we're, you know, we're contributing to democracy. Um, but to your point about how they themselves view it, I think that's, that's a great question. And I'm actually going back um, to put you our on what I bought tickets um, in July, um, and I'm going to do some focus groups with um, some leaders across the country. Um, and so this is actually a question that I can can actually get at. So um, one of the things that's hard when you present a paper that you've done all the research for, you can't really go back in time. Um, but I have kind of the luxury of being able to, to do that, so I will definitely um, get into this question. You're at one o'clock in Amber. Any other? Just oh, something to send you off when you get the back. So I'd love to hear whether if you share your research with them. And now you thought of this is what I found out that, um, you know, that this didn't take the responses that you should distribute. I mean, I would think that if you step outside uh, political science, its quantitative methods and everything, would there a space where you can have a conversation, understand why these leaders do what they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I think I will try and create that space with these, with these focus groups in particular, um, because I do want, I also, again, like I said earlier, like, I don't want the takeaway to be that these are like bad people. I mean, I think there are definitely, as you noted, um, people who just start organizations to steal money, right? Um, but I also think that there are people who really care about their communities and they're trying to do whatever they can to help um, in, in whatever capacity. And so that's the other reason as well that I'm um, doing the citizen survey, because I am curious whether maybe citizens don't care that the NGO leader keeps you know, a lot of money for himself, but then distributes the rest, right? Because they're like, oh, we're all resource poor. So like, of course, they get some money, they're gonna keep a little bit for themselves, right? Um, and so maybe that's less of what matters. And maybe the really big thing that matters is this discrimination aspect, right? Um, or maybe some people prefer the discrimination because they feel like their group needs more, right? Um, and so I'm gonna try and get at some of these ideas, uh, both with the citizen survey, but also with these focus groups that I'll be running. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Hayes.